So the first element is the three-party relationship. So the three-party relationship is comprised of one, the practitioner, two, the responsible party, and third, the intended users. Now the responsible party and the intended user may be from different entities or the same entity. So because there are no issues as to the existence of three-party relationship, so in case the responsible party and the intended user are from different entities. Okay? Like for example, let's say the responsible party is company A. So the user is an outsider. And there is an independent firm called XYZ firm. So in this case, there are three parties. No problem about that. So however, what if company A, the responsible party, and the user come from the same entity? Let's say both of them belong to company A. So that does mean you only have two parties involved, no? company A and XYZ firm only. So because both the responsible party and the user belong to the same organization. So according to the framework, not necessarily. So because the responsible party and the intended user may also come from the same entity and still there will be three-party relationship. So because the relationship between the responsible party and the intended user so needs to be viewed within the context of the specific engagement. Okay? So rather than from the traditionally lines of responsibility. So meaning, for example, in my previous illustration, so if there is an engagement where the information provider, let's say, is the uh, operations department of an entity, and then the user is the board of director of the same entity. So in that case, there are still three parties involved. Okay, So the operations department of the company, the board of directors of the same company or organization, and XYZ auditing firm. So in that case, it will still qualify as a three-party relationship for the purposes of the definition of assurance engagement. So next, let's discuss the practitioner. So the practitioner is broader than the term auditor. So because when you talk about auditor, it only relates to engagements related to audit or review of financial statements. So, but assurance is broader than audit. So a practitioner may be asked to perform services on a wide range of subject matter which may extend beyond you know, the examination of financial aspect or financial statements of an organization. So meaning to say, when we talk about assurance, Compared to audit, okay, so their difference lies in their scope. Assurance is broader than auditing. So auditing, the subject matter is limited to financial information of an entity, okay, while assurance services may be based on subject matter beyond financial aspect of an entity. So let's say the subject matter is the physical capacity or physical characteristic of an item rather than financial aspect of an entity. So that could fall under an assurance service but not an audit. So that is why earlier in our illustration, we provided an example related to audit of financial statements. However, a practitioner may be requested to perform assurance engagement that do not at all involve examination of financial statements but rather an entirely different subject matter, okay? So that is why we mentioned earlier, the practitioner may be engaged on a wide range of subject matters. So examples of other subject matters can include a system of an entity or behavior of its employees or officers or even capacity of a facility. So in short, audit is just one of the many examples of possible assurance engagement. So we're in... In audit, the subject matter is a financial performance or condition. So, but assurance services can provide engagement or can cover engagements whose subject matter is both financial and non-financial in nature. Now, because of this, 
Practitioners may be asked to perform engagement which may require a specialized knowledge or skill. And in this situation, the practitioner should not accept an engagement. If preliminary, uh, preliminary knowledge no, about the engagement circumstances indicate that the ethical consideration or requirement regarding competence or professional competence will not be satisfied. So meaning to say you are asked to perform assurance service on a subject matter that is totally unrelated to your skill or knowledge. So in that case, you have to satisfy first no, the ethical requirement of professional competence before you can accept such an engagement. Now, in some cases, the ethical requirement regarding professional competence can be satisfied by the practitioner using the work of persons from other disciplines or expertise, referred to as experts. So, for example, you are asked to accept an engagement wherein part of the engagement no, require uh, another discipline, like for example, engineering aspect. So in that case, you can still accept the engagement, but for that aspect, which is beyond your expertise, so you'll have to use an expert like uh, an engineer, for example. So when we say expert, so experts are professionals whose uh, field of discipline or specialty is other than accounting or auditing. So therefore, these experts include the lawyers. So sorry, di pa nakita. So other than accounting or auditing. Okay. So professionals other than whose field of expertise are other than accounting or auditing. So example of these experts include uh, lawyers, engineers, actuaries, appraisers, so those are some of the more uh, common experts that we engage related to our practices. So next part of the three-party relationship is the responsible party. So the responsible party is the one responsible for the subject matter or subject matter information. We already discussed earlier no, the difference between the two. So when we talk about subject matter, it's uh, the source of the information. And the subject matter information, so it's the report or the document so related to the evaluation or measurement of the subject matter against the criteria. So for example, in audit of financial statements, the subject matter is the financial information of a company, while the subject matter information is the financial statement or the financial statements. So the financial statements will contain the subject matter, which is the financial position, the financial performance, and cash flows of a certain entity. Okay, now, in assertion-based assurance engagements, which we will discuss later, the responsible party is responsible for the subject matter information and may be responsible for the subject matter. In contrast, in direct reporting engagement, the responsible party is responsible for the subject matter only. So we will elaborate on this distinction when we discuss later the types or classification of assurance engagement according to structure. So just remember for now no, that in assertion-based engagement, the responsible party is responsible for the subject matter information and may be responsible for the subject matter. While for direct reporting engagement, the responsible party is only responsible for the subject matter. So we will know later why. Now, the responsible party may or may not be the engaging party. So when you say engaging party, it is the one who hires the practitioner. So for example, in an audit of financial statements, the company who prepared the financial statements and therefore the responsible party is also the one who hires the independent auditor or the external auditor. So therefore, in that case, the responsible party is also the engaging party. However, in some assurance engagement, it's possible that the practitioner may be hired directly by the users or the party other than the responsible party. So in that case, 
the responsible party is different from the engaging party. And then another important concept, often the responsible party will provide the practitioner a written representation. Okay, about the evaluation or measurement of the subject matter against the criteria. So whether such representation is available to the intended users or not. So meaning to say, it is useful or it is normal for the responsible party to provide written representation to CPA. Okay? However, in some direct reporting engagement or direct reporting engagement, so it's possible that the responsible party will not provide any representation at all to the practitioner. And it will the practitioner who will directly measure or evaluate the subject matter against the criteria. So in short, this is a common question in uh, the CPA board exam. No? If the statement goes like this, so it is useful or it is often that the responsible party issues written representation to the practitioner that is correct, but not always. So because there are some engagement wherein the responsible party will not issue any representation at all to the practitioner. So in that case, the practitioner will be the one who will directly measure or evaluate the subject matter against criteria. The last part of the three-party relationship are the intended users. So the intended users are the person, persons, or class of persons for whom the CPA prepares the assurance report for. So the responsible party can be one of the intended users, but not the only one. So because in case the responsible party and the, responsib and the intended users rather are one and the same, then there will only be two parties involved instead of the three required for assurance engagement. So for example, in the audit of financial statements, the company, being the responsible party, can also be one of the users of the audit report. So meaning they can also receive the audit report from the practitioner. But they should not be the only one who will use such report. So there should be other users of financial statements. Now, like for example, the investor and the creditor. So in that case, the ones who will use the audit report and therefore the intended users include investors, creditors, who are different from the responsible party, which is the company, who can also use the audit report issued by the CPA. Now, another thing, if there is a broad range no, of interested users, like in the audit of financial statements, the intended users may be limited to major stakeholders with significant and common interest. For example, there's a lot of uh, users of financial statements. We have the investors, we have the creditors, we have the employees, the government, and even the general public. So in that case, the auditor can limit the address of the report to the significant or major stakeholders. So also, if practical, the intended users together with the practitioner and the responsible party and engaging party, no, if different, they should be involved no, in determining the requirement of the engagement. However, the practitioner is the only responsible for determining the nature, time, and extent of procedures to be performed in the engagement. So meaning to say, when determining the requirements of the engagement, so all of the parties involved must uh, determine the requirement of the engagement, including the responsible party, the practitioner, so the user if practicable, and even the engaging party if different. Okay? So but the nature of the procedures to be performed are the sole responsibility of the practitioner. So finally, last concept, in certain circumstances, the engagement will have a specific users only. Now, for example, a bank may request information about the uh, quality of a receivable of an entity or company. So therefore, when engagement are designed no, for specified intended users or for a specific purpose, then the practitioner should also consider restricting the assurance report if such engagement is for specified users only. So unlike audit of financial statements wherein the audit report will normally be available publicly so because there is a wide range of user. But if uh, the users are specified or specific, then the auditor should not also make the audit report or the assurance report available to everyone but only to the specified users. 
So that is the first uh, element, three-party relationship.